So welcome from my side as well. Um, we, we start a little bit uh, with uh, some of the now, let's say, more technical topics that we're going to discuss over the next uh, five days. Uh, the goal is the next, uh, let's say, one hour to discuss about trustworthy AI for power systems, right? The idea is to have that as interactive as possible. So I'm here that's so that we can discuss. I have slides, and trust me, I can actually not only fill one hour, I can fill one day, right? Uh, but the idea is that we, we make it this more, more interactive. So what I would like you to do is just whenever there is a, a question or something that you would like to discuss, just uh, speak up. Good. So let me start, and then uh, hopefully I will uh, stimulate your interest so that you can uh, maybe ask different questions. Let's see. Okay, first, uh, a big thanks to a number of people because I wouldn't have been here if they were not, if it was not for them. Um, they have uh, worked over the past uh, a number of years uh, for what I'm going to present today, or some of it. So, uh, I would like first to discuss a bit. So, I, I saw that a lot of you are actually do, dealing with machine learning, right? We also saw that in, in your application. So, the question is why should we? apply machine learning in energy. Yeah, any ideas before actually me going into my ideas? <laughs> yeah. Okay, very good. So can you give me an example? How can you do that? I mean, you have no knowledge, right, about your global data. Yeah. So yeah. how then can, do you think that you're now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, in the past, yeah. same time, yeah. Okay, very good, yeah. Uh, other ideas, yeah. And why would we do that? So what do we want to gain? I mean, by doing that. Mm -hmm. So m maybe it's actually. Yeah. So uh, yeah, my question was mostly. So we, if it's too complex, then maybe you cannot solve it. So we need something, maybe simpler. That or, or is it what? Mm -hmm. Other ideas? Yeah. Because I know that it's used in some other applications. Yeah. But I mean, it's not just for machine learning. But I mean, also, uh, uh, you know, uh, the polyon polyon polyonyms are also differentiable, right? Why should we do machine learning? Okay, and can I not model those? True, it's a benefit, but it's not the reason why we shall go to machine learning. But let's discuss that also in a, in a few minutes, yeah.
so why don't I do that with uh, game theory or with uh, some kind of physics-based modeling? Yeah, I, I let me be a little provocative. Provocative, I would say I disagree, right? So the thing with machine learning. So if you, so let's take this example. Right? So the idea is that uh, I want to uh, uh, emulate or predict, if you want, uh, uh, strategies for data setting, right? If I do that with machine learning, I have to be based on past data, right? So I need access to a lot of data for that. Okay. Do I have this data? Maybe, maybe not, we don't know, right? If I have this data, then maybe it can work. Uh, if I do it with game theory, then I make some assumptions. And I make some assumptions, for example, that my agent is rational or my agent is profit maximizing, right? I make assumptions that usually make sense. Markets do have a sense of irrationality and that's why uh, there's so much work on, on predicting price, right? If everything was predictable, then we wouldn't be here. Um, but the thing is, do you think that with data you can do a better job than um, assuming that let's say it's a profit maximizing entity? It's an open, it's a rhetorical question, right? Uh, but this is a question we should, we should ask, right? The question we, we, should ask, we should ask is not what application do I want to apply that on, right? I, I need first to go a step back and ask myself, is it necessary? to do it with machine learning. And the moment you, you see that there's no other option, then we go ahead, right? And I know that maybe this sounds a bit, um, um, I don't know, strong as a statement, right? Uh, what I'm trying to say is that there's a big trend on, on machine learning methods that we tend to forget everything that we have done over the past decade, right? I have seen a uh, training RL agents, millions of episodes to train on how to optimize, let's say, a battery. And I can tell you there are like departments that they can build battery models. We have OR over the past 50 years that have built optimization algorithms. I can build an optimization how to optimize my battery charging uh, that can work probably better and faster than uh, an RL agent. Okay. RL agents work if you cannot predict, let's say, the prices or if you cannot predict specific parameters in the battery model. But then what I want to claim, what I claim actually, and I mean, you can agree or disagree, right? These are personal views. Is if we go that, that route, then use the physical model Go to the point that we can no longer, this is no longer useful, and then add data to that. Okay, that's let's, let's say one of the, um, uh, yeah, one of the, uh, what I think is, is important to think when we do uh, machine learning. So let me try to uh, summarize a bit uh, when at least I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's not only actually my opinion, right? If you also go to the industry, how many of the industry do you think they are going to accept something that they cannot really understand how it works? There are only two reasons to do that. And the first is when there's no other option. For forecasting, there's no other option. So uh, if, and forecasting is extremely important. Prices, weather is extremely important for me to make profit. If there's no other option, I will try whatever is available. And that's, that is one of the reasons why machine learning has been applied there. It was the first application of machine learning in power systems was for load forecasting. Okay. Good, so when there's no other option, then we go uh, with machine learning. Then at least from what, and again, this is like um, summarizing what I have seen over the past year. Another good reason is when computation speed is important. So we talked about complexity, right? There are a lot of very complex models. So optimization works well, but the moment we scale it up, at some point it breaks, right? So, and then there are like tons of methods how to make that more efficient. 
One of the ideas is also to use machine learning models, and I can tell you that it can work uh, uh, well in some cases. But then you compete with all the rest, right? You compete with all the other methods that try to simplify things, and industry will tell you that, okay, so why shall I apply that if I can do this approximation uh, that I know that I, let's say, I, I disregard some dynamics or I disregard some constraints, right? And I know what I need. With machine learning, if we don't make it trustworthy, and that's what I want to highlight, you don't know what you need. Okay. So the truth is, and that's the reason that now there is some, let's say, push towards that, is that you can be 100 to 1,000 times faster uh, with machine learning models. So if you can achieve this kind of speed up, then it might be worth looking into it. Okay. Questions? Yeah. kind of exploring and discover, discovery, right? Exploration and discovery. So as long as you are not able to, to model that, and maybe it's real data that you don't know what is actually underneath, then this actually goes into there is no other way to, uh, to see wh what, is, uh, what is in there, right? So then, yes. There is also an, uh, an idea. Yeah, so this is actually hidden relationships that you cannot model with physical equations. So as long as you cannot model them with something physical, then, then you need somehow to discover them. And maybe with machine learning, statistically, you can get the correlation that, that you need. Right? Uh, and th there's also another one that uh, is actually uh, a topic of Lesia now that uh, uh, we started PhD on that. Discovery of market-based products or uh, pricing schemes. If you think about markets, how they're organized, there are like tons of different options. Uh, that go from uh, uh, years, months, days, uh, hours, uh, even minutes, right? So how do you uh, bid in such a market? How, we're talking about large mixed interlinear programs. I can model them. I can build an optimization that can do all of it. It will be intractable probably, okay? And then one way maybe to uh, address this is with machine learning uh, uh, approximation. Questions? So what I'm going to focus in this talk uh, is the second part. So I'm not going to talk so much about forecasting, so things we cannot model. I'm going to talk how we can get trustworthiness from things that we are able a bit to understand, okay, and are related to the, let's say, physical world and violations things like that. Um, as I said, we have uh, uh, one hour. I'm not going to go through all my slides. I want this to be a discussion. But you can get the slides and, and take, take a look at them. Okay. So when we go into power systems now, we have extra uh, challenges because these are safety critical systems. And if we want to apply machine learning for the operation of the power system, then things get very, very tricky because you, nobody will trust a black box to put it there in the control room and let's say, yeah. Uh, do your stuff and avoid any blackouts, right? So whenever we try to do something that actually has an impact on the physical world that can actually put things at risk, we need to somehow certify it or make it trustworthy, okay? And that's a major barrier for uh, uh, machine learning in energy, but it's also a major barrier for other um, um, uh, applications, for example, uh, there's a lot of work now on uh, image recognition for MRI, medical applications. MRI is magnetic resonance imaging, right? So w when they actually see uh, there's a scan in your body. Uh, there, is, there is AI tools that are, can actually, let's say, detect if there is a, a, a tumor, right? They can detect if something is not uh, normal. But imagine if they were false positive. Imagine, actually, it's even worse if they were false negative. Imagine if they said that everything is okay and they couldn't detect something uh, in your, 
uh, amino disease or, or, or um, um, yeah. So the, there is a lot of work in trying to make machine learning trustworthy. It's important because there are things that you cannot really, so uh, name as recognition for machine, for uh, machine learning for MRIs is important because we cannot always detect uh, what is in the picture. So it's very important to be able to uh, to be better at that, but we also need to be trustworthy that we don't have false negatives or false positives. So there's a lot of uh, work doing that. Uh, and there is a, a lot of uh, interest in that. So first of all, quality, right? So in Europe, at least in 2021, uh, there is this uh, uh, actually a document that was published by the European Commission uh, where we need rules and actions to turn Europe into a hub for trustworthy artificial intelligence. So Margrethe Vestager is uh, actually a Danish politician that's now the commissioner uh, of competition. Uh, and they actually put forward that machine learning or artificial intelligence need to be trustworthy. And the, the way that they see it is that they need to be trustworthy for the consumer, right? So the, the first angle that they took, and this is also very important, is that if there is an AI tool like ChatGPT or anything that's monitoring me, I need to understand what it can do and what it cannot do about me and my data, okay? And this means that we need to turn or convert our machine learning tool to something that we can really understand and not be something hidden that we don't know how it affects. So there is already uh, two years uh, that, we, that we started and there's now also a call uh, for uh, a, European research project to have a trustworthy machine learning for energy and a lot of different things are developing since uh, this uh, happened two years ago. Okay. Gurobi just recently uh, published their new version. Do you know, who doesn't know Gurobi? Yeah, so Gurobi is an optimization solver. Uh, it solves uh, linear programs like uh, DCOPF, also nonlinear and mixed interlinear programs. It's very popular, it's very good also for mixing the linear programs, okay? So as we're going to see, verifying neural networks is a mixing the linear program in the basic form. Gurobi actually added that in their capabilities, okay? And uh, has optimized code for that. So you can also verify neural networks now based on that. There is a competition that takes place. I don't know how many of you uh, probably, yeah. Uh, it, it has been under the radar, but it has been in the machine learning community quite, um, um, th there's quite interest there uh, for verifying neural networks. And the fourth edition is this year. Over the past three years, the idea is to build optimization solvers. Because at the, at the end of the day, uh, training neural networks is an optimization procedure. Verifying neural networks is an optimization procedure. But the thing is that these general solvers like Gurobi has, they are not uh, tailored for this problem. So if you go into a deep neural network and you try to verify that, it uh, can take ages or maybe not even solve. Yes. Verify, yeah. I'm going to discuss this also later. The idea is that I want to certify that, so let's say, say I train my neural network for certain uh, range of inputs, right? Uh, I don't know, let's, uh, let's take the simplest example, OPF, right? I want to train a neural network to determine the best set point. I train it when my loads vary between 60 and 100%, okay? Now, when I train it for the 60 and 100%, I want to make sure that my neural network will never lead to violations. So the optimal set point that it determines, it never, let's say, uh, crosses a line flow limit or a voltage limit or whatever. So then a verification tool, what it's going to do is take this train neural network, convert it to a mixed interlinear program, we're going to discuss that uh, in a few minutes, and then uh, may certify that, you know what, this neural network for this range of inputs, it will never violate uh, this limit, right? Is that formal method? Yes, formal method, yes.
No. So this is very, so what the idea is that actually you can also put in the training function of the neural network another term that actually penalizes this kind of violations. But it's only penalizing those. So you can improve the performance, so you can have less violations, but there is no certification that it will never violate, right? Yes. So verification is formal, exact, it, it's a guarantee, right? It's guaranteed that it doesn't. Fully agree. So when we consider 100,000 times faster, we must consider the training in. No, no, include the training. And I can show you some results with 100 times faster, including the training. It, you just need, then this problem maybe is not the best for uh, uh, applying machine learning. If you need to retrain every, every day and then you need a week to train in order to apply it further. I agree. So then either we need to think how to improve that or maybe it's not the right application. Right, it's one of the two. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I either certify that it does not violate or I don't certify. So I cannot tell then because it's an optimization so you need to actually cross the boundary. The moment I cross the boundary of the, and everything is in the safe region, then I have certified that the lower bound. But I, I optimize over a lower bound. If my lower bound is, is in the, uh, let's say, unsafe position, I cannot say anything if it's uh, truly safe or not. Does it make sense? If I'm proving in the data, in, yeah? It, I don't need to see it, I just need to assume it. So what I assume is that my input will vary within this range for all data. For, yes, I'm not sampling, it's continuous. It's a continuous domain and I can, uh, Verify for the continuous domain. The integer variables are only for the ReLUs. I can, I can actually, uh, yeah, I, I, I will show a few examples on that. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So it's uh, easy to put cli to clip, let's say, the, uh, to the variables that are be between bounds, right, that they don't violate. But if, let's say, I want to determine the optimal generation set point and I want to, to verify that does not violate a line flow, it's not, e you cannot do that. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. 
then you have to retrain. Okay, then you have to retrain. Uh, in, 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 but now you know where you don't perform well, and then yeah, or just discard the model, one of the two. Or use it where you trust it. So maybe then you will never use it in that region because you know that this is not trustworthy there. Okay. Good. Let me show you some uh, results. Uh, Jalal have until 11:15, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is from a very recent paper. We just submitted that actually uh, during the weekend. Uh, and I don't have the archive uh, yet on, but I will have it on Wednesday. So what we did is we, we developed, actually, we adjusted or adapted the, the winning uh, algorithm for, from this BNN competition that's actually open source, so you can all use it. They have published papers. You can all see how this works, right? So we have taken that, and we compared that with Gurobi, right? Uh, and you can see that, I mean, for cases that it can solve, it has a seven times speed up, and then there are cases that cannot solve. So, okay, if I want to ver if if I cannot verify, I can do that easily. So, if if I my lower bound, uh, let's say if I find a, okay, if I find a violation, it's very easy to do. I find the first violation, then I know it's not verified. I'm done. Bye. Right. The difficult thing is to certify that there is no violation. So I need to actually go through all possible combinations, right? So when it's easy to certify that there is a violation, you can see that's actually very, uh, uh, it takes just a few, less than a minute. Alpha, beta, crown can do that seven times faster. But the main challenge is how do you certify? And now we have here um, an example where this is certified that does not violate any line limit. Uh, Gurobi did not finish within an hour. And uh, for alpha, beta, crown, with our adjustments, it took uh, 18 seconds, right? Huge speed up with tailored solvers. And this would get better and better. Good. Uh, one more thing I want to discuss about, because we talk about trustworthiness. Trustworthiness is not only verifiability. Trustworthiness is also including the physics. It's also interpretability. OK. Uh, and then we have the sub values that actually uh, also the industry is using. SUP stands for uh, supply additive explanation. Okay. These are sensitivity factors uh, where what happens is that um, I perturb my input and see what is the impact on the output. I perturb a single input and I see what is the input, the uh, impact on my output, right? And this is very interesting because then I can understand which feature is important. How every feature actually affects my uh, the, the neural network output. And here I have a result actually with Yusun that's also here. Uh, he was actually the, the first author of this paper uh, a few years ago that uh, we worked on trying to predict uh, if uh, a prosumer is producing or consuming, so just classification. And we just, we just did that in order to, to test how the SAP works, actually. That was our main idea. And you can see, for example, here I can just explain that this is the first is the, the, the load values. You can see that the, the red means higher load. The higher the load, the more pr probability is that it's going to be negative consumption, right? The, the higher is the irradiation, then the more probability is that it's going to be a positive consumption. So you can understand how your model classifies. And that's very important. Industry is also using that. You can take a look at it. It's also open source on Python. Have has anybody used that already? So a uh, preview of uh, uh, this talk is that energy, so if, if you want to remember three things, uh, besides maybe the method, method we're going to discuss, is that energy systems are safety critical systems. So if we apply to a safety critical operation, the question is, can we trust it? Yeah.
So I think I need to understand a bit better the details and can discuss on the break. But I think from the first, I think it's it's very possible. Yes, to do that. Yes. Good. Second is yeah. You want to? No, it's okay because uh, there are two more questions. Yes, I'll do that in a few minutes. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, so these are now different limits for the generators. If I have very small limits, then I definitely go out outside the, I have violation. The moment I make my limits quite broad, then I have no violation. So this is just different scenarios. It's not that, yeah. Yeah. Great question, and actually, yeah, this is complete. Yeah, this is a, another important topic uh, because what I can verify is for the assumptions I have made that this is my limit. Now, if this assumption about my limit is correct or not, it's a, a question that we need actually, yeah, to figure out. I'm not sure it does, to be honest, because then what if uh, there is a one adversarial example that actually throws my model uh, out, completely out? Will I trust that? Or I mean, if I'm used to be trusting that 99% of the time, the moment that will come and I don't have my safety guarantees or maybe clipping the boundaries as a first step, then uh, I will trust again because I'm used to trusting that. And then things can go really bad. Okay, Th that's the main. And then try to include physics in form, or let's say physics in the model. So think well before applying machine learning. What is the reason I'm doing that? What's the benefit? Is there something else that can help me do that better or faster? Good. So I have uh, now about uh, 20 minutes, uh, or maybe 25, to discuss a bit about uh, uh, different uh, topics. One that popped up was how do we do the verification? And I'm going to talk about this. And I'm also going to talk about physics in from neural networks because this gives me the 100 times speed up, including the training. Okay, we have done different work. I, I'm going to skip a number of these slides about the framework for machine learning uh, uh, in power systems. Um, so just let me, I can just go to the, to the large, to one of the, oh, so this slide, so, this is the whole procedure, right? If you see we have a training database, we train a neural network, uh, and, and then that's where we end. We need to improve, if we want to improve the performance, there are different ways to do that. The first is we get better data because everything is based on data. So use the knowledge that we have about, let's say, the physical models or the physical um, uh, um, instances in order to get better data. The second is to train with physics informed uh, neural networks and then help, yeah, help actually with the, um, we can train, check the accuracy, if the accuracy is not good, we can actually resample and retrain. And I can tell you this can work quite fast. So you can get a few data, train, and do that faster instead of trying to get a perfect database uh, from, the, from the beginning and use that. Uh, then is a verification that we discuss about and we'll discuss more. And then we can also do this kind of retraining. So resample where we fail with the verification. And then the last one is the, what I call the holy grail. And we discuss also a bit, maybe not exactly about that, uh, where I can bridge the training of the neural network with the verification in one thing. So I have a neural network training procedure that finds or minimizes the average error and also minimizes the worst case guarantees, okay? Ideally, we want the certification. What we're going to see is that we can achieve, uh, let's say, we can minimize the worst error for now. So I'm going to give you, yes. 
Um, more, it's feedback loop, but it's the same as we do the iterations of packet propagation. It's not a feedback loop, exactly. I can do that simultaneously. It's very computationally intensive. So then we can actually split it and do small feedback loops within iterations. But this happens during the back propagation training. And one of the reasons is because I can differentiate through, right? Also through the, the milk that I'm going to do. Very good. So let's go into that. Okay. So uh, first, just one slide about to get uh, everybody on the same page. Neural networks is nothing else than an advanced form of nonlinear regression, okay? So what I'm trying to do is I have a bunch of data, and let's say I want to fit here for linear regression into a line. I want to determine my weights W1 and W2 so that it fits well the dis relation between the inputs X and output Y, right? So I'm trying to minimize the distance between my estimated output uh, Y hat and my data from the input, or from the out output data that I have as labels. Good. Now, a recent uh, development has been this automatic differentiation. I can actually differentiate through my neural, so I can differentiate all output with respect to the inputs during my neural network training. And we're going to use that. As for what I have here is an example of a swing equation. How many of you know what a swing equation is? Okay. So for the rest, power systems are modded like uh, it's very similar to a mass spring system, right? I have a mass, have a spring, and it oscillates. It's the same thing, that's exactly what this equation 6D does there. It actually models the oscillation of a mass against the wall over a spring. So now what I want to do is I want to train a neural network to predict what, where, uh, what will be my frequency in my rotor angle, so where my mass will be, right? Uh, what will be my frequency in my rotor angle over time. So I start from somewhere, I have an initial condition. I can actually say that uh, I have this level of power. What will be the frequency in five seconds from now? If I do that uh, conventionally, I need an ODE solver. This is an ordinary differential equation. I need to iterate over that, get solutions. So I go stepwise uh, until five seconds uh, in order to get it. Neural networks can do that actually much faster because they they get the whole, uh, they don't need to integrate. So how does this work here? So I have my uh, uh, standard, the original loss function, where I try to actually build a neural network that tries to get uh, the, the router angle as close as possible to the uh, label that I have, but now add a regularization factor. What this does is I get the output of my, I, I randomly sample T and P, I get my output delta, whatever this is, right? I, I get the, the first derivative and the second derivative and I put it into this equation. And now this equation must be equal to zero. So I have it in my objective function in order to penalize that. So what I do is during training, I randomly sample inputs, I pass them through the neural network, I plug input and output in this equation in every iteration and I'm trying to minimize uh, the distance between the output and what the equation says. So I'm finding the weights in order to bring as close as possible the output to, uh, to this equation so that it's equal to zero, so that it can satisfy that. Is that clear? Good. Let me give you an example now. So we work with Ersted, actually, Lycia is from Ersted, but we work with a different uh, department. What we try to, so the main problem that they have uh, is that um, they spend 15 days during the design of a wind farm to assess critical scenarios, right? 15 days. So if there are, if there, and we expect a lot more wind farms coming up, as you saw in the Northeast. So if there is a way to accelerate that, this could be very, very interesting for them. So we took the model uh, that they use, and they use actually elect electromagnetic transient simulations. These are the very fast uh, uh, um, microsecond uh, step simulations. And we trained a physics-informed neural network in order to estimate the region of attraction. So the idea is that uh, I try to find which 
operating points that are actually uh, and when I start from an operating point or let's say of a disturbance point, if this is going to converge to a stable equilibrium point or not. So I have a lot of points based on disturbances, right? How many will converge to a stability and how many will diverge? So we did that any of the pins with GPUs and that's very important, okay? Um, and the result is that we are 100 times faster. So something that we estimated 5 million points uh, that with Orsted, uh, Orsted's model in our HPC, high performance computing cluster here at DPU, it will take two days to estimate for these five million points if they will converge to an equilibrium point or not. With pins, both training and the evaluation took 30 minutes. We split it to something like that. Why? Exactly because if I go back, I no longer need to integrate. I need to randomly sample, get the output, plug it into the equation, no integration, and make sure that this uh, complies with HRT. Yes. Not strictly, okay. indeed. So I'm, I'm, I'm still approximating, right? As, as good as I, and that's why here I can only, uh, what I've shown here is only by inspection. So EMT versus spin, that they look similar. not just help, I'm actually training neural networks to learn the model, so now the neural network can act as the model. Yeah. No. Uh, it has to be differentiable because you do automatic differentiation. No, not even. No, because it's just, you just evaluate it, no. As far as I know, no, nothing uh, at least, uh, yes. And that's the main thing because this EMT simulations take a lot of time to compute. So, and that's one application that makes sense at least to, to my eyes because it's a very, this EMT is actually very difficult to solve. They have, a, industry has a lot of problems solving bigger models of EMT. And pins can actually give a computational advantage with again, not, Perfect accuracy, we don't know that yet. Seems that it works well at the beginning. The next step is to verify that. We haven't done that. Okay, good. So this is one of the topics. I would also like now to go a bit into the verification. Uh, let me skip that, we can also see that in the... So we talked a lot about verification, so let's now understand how this works. The main idea, and I already hinted towards that, is that it is an exact transformation. I can convert any neural network that is at least trained, uh, that uses ReLU, and I will discuss what is this activation function. I can convert it to a, a, a mixed interlinear program or to some more exact, to a set of linear equations with Banach. So anything that I have actually trained, uh, all the information that I encode it in the neural network can be converted to linear equations with Banach. And then I can formulate an optimization problem and solve it. Good, so let's see how this works. Let's take a very uh, a simple neural network, two layers, uh, six neurons. Um, what happens is anything that's outside the neuron is a linear function. So these are our linear weights. Everything is a linear relationship. So anything that happens outside the activation function, I can model it with a matrix. Now. The, the question is what happens with the activation function, and there are actually a lot of them. We have also hyperbolic tangent, right? Uh, we have also uh, sigmoid and others. If we take the ReLU activation function, that's the most popular at the moment, and it's the most popular because for deep learning has shown quite uh, good um, uh, performance over large models, then this is a piecewise linear function. The ReLU is nothing else saying that if, if my input 
here is negative, then please u4 b0. If my input here is positive, then uh, please propagate the input to the output. Y is equal x, that's all. Okay. I can model that with a max operator. It's the same thing. And if it's a max operator, then I can also, I can also uh, uh, model that with binaries. So I have one binary variable per neuron. If the binary is zero, then propagate zero. If the binary is one, propagate the input, okay? So by doing that, I can get actually all the operations that happen in the neural network from the input to the output into a set of linear equations with binaries. So then I can optimize over that. So let's, uh, let, let's take an example. This is for classification. This is actually an actual uh, example that we have built a projection on two generators. So this is from zero to 100% uh, their capacity. Where is it safe and where is it unsafe? So green is safe, blue is unsafe. Red is misclassification. Okay, so we have generated a lot of samples just to see how our algorithm works. It doesn't need, you don't need to generate the samples. This is just for us to evaluate how this works. We just generate one, we take this, this reference point X, and let's say we evaluate, and then we know that this is safe. Now what I want to do is tell me uh, if within this region, let's say with distance epsilon uh, from, from X, if my classification changes. If my classification doesn't change, then I can, set, I can guarantee that all the inputs, or all actually, all the inputs in that region will be classified as safe. Right? And by that, I actually certify patches. Are they classified as safe? Actually, yeah, I can I guarantee patches if they are uh, classified as safe or unsafe. This is the original method. Then, as long as I know how the neural network behaves, it's already a step towards not be this being a black box. And then I can actually check, okay, so this is what the, my neural network is gonna do. Does this uh, correspond to reality? And then I, I check, let's say, the boundary conditions, if you want, with uh, the ground truth, if this is works or not. This is the first step. I'm going then to build on, th on that. Is that clear? So for classification purposes, this is what's done. For image processing, this is exactly what's done, because I have no other, what we are going to see is I can include the, uh, um, underlying knowledge I have about my system because I can model that with physical, with equations and I can certify on the spot. But for image processing, there is no physical model that can tell me if this is a cause or not. So what, what this method does is certifies that as long as these are the, the, the input images that vary between this uh, and this area, then you will definitely uh, detect a cause or that's what the, a neural network will do, and then it's up to you to understand if this works or not. Yes. Yes. Uh, up to now to a few thousands of neurons okay. with this uh, alphabet crown. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you check, because we started that a few years ago, at that point we had the uh, uh, four layers. 50 neurons, per, so 200 neurons, and we needed to make some kind of um, manipulations to make sure that we uh, can certify that. So we're able to do 200 neurons back then. Now with these new tools, it's actually, yeah. Question? Good. Let me now build on that because power systems or let's say physics-based systems, whatever this is, has a key advantage that has spent decades developing models that predict how things work, that predict physics. So now what I can do is I can get this certification from my neural network and compare it in one algorithm versus the underlying physical knowledge using the physical model. And then I can estimate how bad is my prediction, right? Or how bad does my neural network perform? Yes. Yeah. 
decision trees definitely. Yes, and there is work uh, on that. Yes. Good. So let's uh, see a bit how this works. Uh, so again, I think I talked about this. L let me go directly to the example. And uh, again, the simple thing I can use is a DCOPF here. So I try to determine set points, uh, and I have all this. Um, uh, the, the, these are linear constraints uh, about power balance, transmission line limits, and generator limits. Okay, and there has been actually a lot of papers, even for DCOPF, showing a lot of speed up. Again, only on the evaluation, not on the training, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, there have been uh, quite some out there. So what we try to do is to get the performance guarantees, so uh, ensure that there is no violation of line flows, no violation, not to even ensure actually determine if there is violation and how much viol this violation is. Line flows, generator bounds, although we can clip the bounds, right, for generators. Uh, Suboptimality, and how, so how far am I from the, the estimate of my neural network, how far is it from uh, the actual optimal? And the distance between the operating point that my neural net network predicts and the distance that my uh, actual operating point, optimal operating point is. So, this has been used. I'm going to focus only on two, and one is generator bounds, and the other is uh, line flows. So this is how uh, simply you can, uh, how we set up the optimization problem. The idea is to maximize the, uh, the deviation from the uh, upper or lower bound of my generator, right? So get me the maximum deviation from the bound, either from the upper bound or lower bound, subject to the, to the following things. The first is that uh, my, my load must be within 60 and 100% of the capacity. So over all the domain of, of that load, um, I, 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 I get my neural network, right? So all of the neural network is a set of linear constraints with binaries across my input domain, that is the load, get me the output, that's the estimate PG, and get me the maximum deviation from the upper or lower bound. Is that clear or not? Did I confuse you? Or what is not clear? No, not, far, not yet. I have trained my neural network. This is a trained neural network. So, Yes, I just evaluate. I have, and now evaluate for all the possible inputs with, with between 60 and 100 percent, what is the maximum generator violation? Yes. I haven't thought about that. I can think a bit about this. It's a sensitivity that's going to be how much the, the violation changes based on the load. So maybe it can give you some things, but yeah. So this is a trained neural network, and I certify for that. It's, um, the next is I can replace this function here, a mu of g, with the line flow limit. Same thing exactly. Okay, let's see some, resu some results. So seven different case studies from nine to 300 bus systems. I have trained neural networks for DCOPF for all of them. On the left side, it said the empirical lower bound. So over, I have trained with training data. Over all training and test data, what's the worst case violation? And on the right side is the exact worst case guarantees. Continuous input domain, what's the worst case violation across any, so even the data that I have not sampled. So you can see that for the 300 bus, uh, the actual violation can be seven times larger. So this is what, ha what will happen in the domain that we had never seen if I have just focused on my training data. And another very powerful result is that I can also certify that, let's say, for this 57 bus case, there is no violation. So I can take this neural network, deploy it in the ILT, and will never violate my line flows. Yes. 
So the first quick answer would be we cannot provide any guarantee anymore, right? Because we have twisted domains. And we haven't looked into this. It, there might be some smart ways to, let's say, do some manipulations and then guarantee fast again for the new domain. But I'm not sure. So let me talk a little bit about what I call the holy grail, which actually combined the two, and, and then uh, conclude, okay? And then you can see the rest of the slides uh, online. We have tried, did quite a new things to accelerate and so on. So what's the next natural step? Is actually get the certification that we talked about and put it into the neural network training, okay? Um, so, these are now the three different types. This is the standard neural network training. I train based on, on, on data, minimize the distance. Then we discussed uh, together, I think, that we can put the violation in, the objective function, so I penalize violation. This gives me no certificate, but I can definitely achieve something better. Okay, I reduce the, the, the violations by penalizing them on the objective function of the neural network. Uh, and actually, Nando, that is going to be with us uh, tomorrow, has uh, done some really nice work there. Then I'm going a step further, and I want to penalize the worst case values. So I don't care now about all violations. I just want to bring the worst case violations as close to the boundary as possible, ideally certify that there is no violation. We haven't achieved that yet, but we have definitely managed to bring them closer. So then how do we do that? It's actually um, quite interesting, but also a bit, uh, uh, it, it took actually quite some work. So what we do is we convert the neural network to a MILP, then we fix the binaries in order to be able to uh, differentiate that, and then it's a linear program that can differentiate through. It's a differentiable layer that back propagation can use, or can back propagate through, and through that I can actually include that in the back propagation domain. And recently, I've also seen something for MILP. So the next step for us is actually to back to get through a MILP. But that's the whole idea. We have also uh, focused maybe on the on the last on the weight of the last layer because these were uh, having the biggest impact on the violations. You see, we do a number of things to make that computationally tractable, right? So there's a lot of work still to be done there. Let me give you some results. ACOPF now. Because the idea for us, for neural networks, is that they should be applied to ACOPF. This is the challenging problem. Four different test cases, I compare uh, three different things. The standard neural network, so no um, penalization of the violation. The gen NN that we call, it's penalizing uh, the violations in the objective function, and then penalizing the worst case values, okay? So you can see that uh, this, uh, our approach here, this worst case uh, NN, manages to reduce uh, the violation to 0% for this 39 bus system, but also reduce the mean average error. So the main takeaway from that, that uh, at least I want you to remember, is that these are not necessarily conflicting objectives. Reducing the worst case violation doesn't really mean that my average performance deteriorates. I can find points, it's a, such a vast optimization space and non-covex, I can find points that are both perform better and reduce the worst case value. The second is here for the 118 bus case, uh, where, I mean, we maintain the same mean average error, um, mean absolute error, but we managed to uh, reduce the worst case violations by uh, 100%, by 50%. And you can see here that, uh, in this case at least, uh, penalizing just the violations does not do something for the worst case, because these are usually points somewhere else. And with that, uh, I conclude with this final thought. Okay, so if, if we want to accelerate things by 10, 100, or 1,000 times, we need to think differently. We need to make sure that physics cannot, um, we need to use as much as we can by physics, but the truth is if I want to accelerate something by 100 times, maybe physics is not only the only way to, uh, to, to go there. Uh, AI, AI needs operation research, um, and then there are a lot of challenges, topology is one of them, and that we can discuss. But I, I will stop here. Um, yeah. <laughs>